what we do here is go back, 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 back. back. One way to overcome the problem of drying out on land is to only live in moist places. When conditions get dry, the plant survives by resting in a dormant state until conditions become wet again. About 438 million years ago, a group of plants called bryophytes appeared which could have survived in this way during dry conditions. Bryophytes include the small plants that we call mosses. Mosses have distinct leaf-like structures. They are not true leaves because they do not have any vascular tissue with xylem or phloem. Another group of bryophytes called the liverworts grow on the ground like a flat plate without any leaves. Mosses are more successful on land than the early types of plants because they sim their simple leaves increase the surface area for photosynthesis. There is also a simple cuticle to reduce water loss from the plant. Mosses often have a central midrib of long cells on each leaf that bring water from the surroundings. Bryophytes have simple root-like structures called rhizoids that anchor the plants to the surface. They are not specialized to absorb water. Water can be absorbed from any part of the plant that is damp. Bryophytes have no woody tissue to support them, so they are always small plants. Another problem of living on land is how to reproduce. The cells used for sexual reproduction are called gametes. Female gametes or egg cells and male gametes or sperm are very delicate structures that easily dry out. The sperm also need to swim in water to find the egg cell. Bryophytes such as mosses have managed to overcome this problem. The gametes are protected from drying out by being inside a box made of cells. The egg cells are in a flask shaped archegonium that has a long neck. The sperm are in a ball shaped or club shaped antheridium. The archegonium and the antheridium sit in the cup of leaves called the rosette at the top of the plant. When it is wet, the sperm are released from the antheridium and swim in the moisture to an archegonium in another cup of leaves to fertilize the egg cells. The fertilized egg becomes an embryo that is held inside and protected by the archegonium. The embryo does not become a new leafy moss plant. It develops into the spore producing body called the capsule or sporangium. The sporangium is on a long stalk that holds it up high in the air. When the sporangium is ripe, the spores are released into the air and get blown away. If they land in a moist place, they will germinate and grow into a new moss plant. They do this by making long filament called a protonema. The protonema develops many buds. Each bud contains a new moss plant. In mosses, the gamete-making generation always makes a spore-making generation. The spore-making genera generation then makes a new gamete-making generation. Another way to live successfully on land is to resist water loss. Most plants that live successfully on land have ways to increase the amount of water they can absorb and can then conserve that water in their bodies. Water loss can be resisted by having large roots or a branch system of roots that can take in a lot of water, special tissue called xylem to carry water to the leaves, or a waterproof cuticle around the outside of a plant that reduces the loss of water. A thick waterproof cuticle also stops air getting into the leaves for photosynthesis. So there is a small hole called stomata for gas exchange. About 400 million years ago, a new group of plants appeared. These plants could grow larger and were able to absorb soil water more effectively because they had a system of pipes to carry water through the plant quickly. This system of pipes was made of specialized cells called xylem. These larger plants also needed tissue called phloem to carry nutrients from the leaves to all other parts of the plant. Phloem and xylem are collectively called the vascular tissue, and plants with vascular tissue are called the vascular plants. The pteridophytes were the first group of vascular plants. Simple pteridophytes such as club mosses have DNA in the chloroplast that is similar to 
to clear across DNA in the mosses, liverworts and green algae. The most common pteridophytes today are the ferns. Ferns have different chloroplast DNA to simple pteridophytes. Ferns have large true leaves called fronds. Each frond has a strong stalk called the rachis that is attached to the, a horizontal underground stem called a rhizome. The South African tree ferns have an upright stem instead of a rhizome. The rachis supports the frond and exposes it to sunlight for photosynthesis. Most ferns have fronds that are divided into leaflets called pinnae. In some ferns, leaflets are further divided into smaller pinnules. The epidermis of the frond is covered with a waterproof cuticle that protects it from losing water and drying out. Pores called stomata on the lower epidermis control the amount of water lost so the plant can survive during dry conditions. The veins have xylem and phloem. The fronds have meristematic tissue at the tips so that fronds can grow larger. Ferns have true roots called adventitious roots at the nodes of the rhizomes. The adventitious roots anchor the plant firmly in the soil and absorb water and minerals. There are many root hairs to increase the surface area of the roots so the plants can absorb enough water to survive. On the lower surface of the fully developed pinnae are small brown patches called sori. Sori contains special structures called sporangia. Sporangia make spores that are released when they are immature. The fern plant is therefore a the spore making generation. This is different from the moss where the moss plant has the gamete making generation. The spore of the fern grows in a small hot shaped structure called a prothallus. A prothallus can only grow in damp areas because like moss plants, it has no vascular tissue and no true roots. The reproductive organs are found on the lower surface of the prothallus. There are antheridia and archegonia that are quite similar to those of a moss. The sperm swim to an egg cell and fertilize it and make an embryo that starts the next generation of fern plants. The prothallus shrivels up when the new fern starts to grow. Reproduction in the pteridophytes has the same problems as bryophytes. The prothallus is a simple structure that makes, must be kept moist at all time. The sperm need to swim in water to reach the egg cell so they can only reproduce sexually in places where it is wet for a long time each year. Also, the spore is light and cannot hold a supply of food or protect itself from drying out, so it can only germinate and grow in moist places. Ferns cannot live in many areas on earth because they need wet conditions for several weeks to reproduce. The next step to making plants suitable for life on land was the formation of seeds. Seeds are more successful than spores in spreading plants. Seeds hold an embryo that is ready to grow. They can store lots of food that helps the young plant grow quickly and get a good start in life. They also have a resistant outer coat to protect themselves from drying out or being damaged. Seeds can therefore rest for many years until the conditions are suitable for them to grow. The gymnosperms are the simplest of the seed-bearing plants alive today. There are several different groups of gymnosperms. The most common type is a conifer. Conifers first appeared about 290 million years ago. Conifers are well suited to live on land because the plant has true leaves that are needle-shaped so that there is a small surface area from which to lose water. Leaves with thick old epidermal cells that are covered in a waxy cuticle to reduce water loss stomata that are sunken into the epidermis to further reduce water loss from the leaves. Well-developed leaves, roots and stems with vascular tissue to carry water and nutrients through the plants. A taproot with well-developed lateral roots. Roots that have a symbiotic relationship with fungi to make mycorrhizae. The mycorrhizae increase the surface area of, for the absorption of water and minerals. A cambium between the xylem and phloem which forms secondary tissues. Secondary tissues strengthen the plant so that it can grow taller and wider and carry more water to the leaves. Conifers have an advantage over the more primitive land plants because they use seeds instead of spores to spread the plant. Conifers have special reproductive structures called cones, which contain the gametes. The male gamete is held inside a very small spore called a pollen grain. Pollen grains are found inside male cones and are spread by the wind. The female gamete is held in, large, in a larger spore which is inside a special structure called an ovule. Each ovule con containing the female gamete is protected by a woody cone scale of the female cone. The wind blows a pollen grain containing a male gamete onto the female cone scale. The pollen grain then grows a short tube called a pollen tube. 
The male gamete is carried inside the pollen tube to the female gamete, so the conifer does not need water for fertilization. Conifers are very successful plants that grow throughout the world from the tropics to the coldest places. They are very well suited to life on land, but the ovules that contain the female gametes are not very well protected because they sit on open scales. About 200 million years ago, the angiosperms or flowering plants appeared. Like the gymnosperms, the angiosperms are seed-bearing plants. They also have true leaves, vascular tissues, well-developed roots, and strengthening tissue. Reproductive structures are protected in the flower. The next and final step in the evolutionary development process that makes plants suitable for life on land was to enclose the ovule. In the angiosperms, the ovules that contain the female gametes are well protected because they are held inside a closed container called the ovary in the flower. Many angiosperms came to rely on animals to carry their male gametes to the ovary. For this to work well, each flower is made to attract a particular kind of animal. The use of animals to carry male gametes is more reliable and less wasteful than wind. When the pollen grain with the male gamete lands on the stigma of the flower, a pollen tube grows down the style towards the ovary. Angiosperms do not need water for fertilization because the male gamete is carried inside the pollen tube to the female gamete in the ov ovule. After fertilization, the ovule develops into a seed and the ovary develops into a fruit. Each kind of angiosperm has a fruit that is well suited for spreading the seed it contains. These advantages made angiosperms the most successful kind of plants on earth and they have spread to dominate the land surface. When it comes to angiosperms, the structures such as the roots, stems and leaves come in many different forms which has enabled many different types of angiosperms to survive on land almost everywhere such as where it is very dry, very wet, very cold and very or very hot. Angiosperms can also be many different sizes from tiny floating plants which are less than 1 centimeter across when fully grown to trees that are more than 100 meters tall. 